at U of A had kind of a partnership with Bioware, like that would be pretty cool. So I went there, I did kind of gamey things. And I was even sort of on the fence with that. And then uh, the professor who ended up being my supervisor uh, had a class where it was to do something for his um, uh, real-time strategy game. So I'm like, you know what, screw it. I'm going right down the game path. So going back in time a little bit, let's go back in time to 15 years ago. Um, you, me, and the OG Fat Games, Phil, Gary, and even to a lesser extent, maybe Brad, um, you're the only one who went into AAA video game development. Like what motivated you to like, what, what was, why did you pick to do that instead of, I don't know, going and becoming a software engineer for... I don't know, um, a bank. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think I, I probably would have done that. Uh, but then I did a summer at the U of R doing research um, for Dr. Hamilton, you'll remember. Uh, and that kind of led me down the path of like, this is research. This is kind of what getting a master's degree would be. So I started looking into that. And then that U of A had kind of a partnership with Bioware, like that would be pretty cool. So I went there, I did kind of gamey things and I was even sort of on the fence with that. And then uh, the professor who ended up being my supervisor uh, had a class where it was to do something for his um, uh, real-time strategy game. So I'm like, you know what, screw it. I'm going right down the game path. So I took that, I ended up doing my thesis in. Um, pathfinding and i was just like let's you know pedal to the metal let's let's try and get a job in games kind of thing and i almost didn't i actually very briefly started at another company because bioware's hiring process was kind of lengthy so i was there for not very long until i went like all right bye guys i'm getting my dream job so uh but yeah there was a few like branches where i might have gone down a different route but i ended up here, in the which, multiverse, maybe you ended up somewhere else. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure there's this, most alternate versions of me are not here. <laughs> hey, Doug, That's would you name. say that your job is actually very resource oriented, or is it a lot of just like coding, coding, or do you actually do a lot of research to be able to like execute um, certain things that the game needs? No, it's. There's very little research, I would say, at least for my job. Um, I, I remember when I was doing my master's and uh, looking at it from that side, there was always a, uh, a thing like, why don't, why don't game companies use more research? You know, this is, uh, we have all this cool stuff. And um, definitely now looking at it from the other side, it's like, no, this, you have to get this feature done right here uh and uh and that's I mean, every company that's not certain certain ones so the idea on this side of going to your manager and saying like hey can i have like five months to just screw around and see what falls out like now the the, the to-do list for a game is way way longer than that so so, so would you say that like i, I guess a lot of the technology you use in games is kind of technology has already been developed and you're just trying to create it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and again, that's from my side. So there are, uh, say, components of um, engines, for instance, like maybe if, if you're working on an engine, you might do, you know, the, there, there's no shortage of really interesting problems. Uh, in this kind of space so like i know people who have written like a memory manager for a, a playstation and like a renderer for an xbox and that, that kind of thing and there's definitely research to be done there or like snow deformation or, or that kind of thing so there's definitely pockets of it but it it kind of yeah you, you either have a particular thing to make it or uh 
if you're working as part of a game team, you generally grab it as, as a known commodity. Uh, so yeah, there definitely is research there, but yeah, from the side of a, a game team, for the most part, you're just kind of, uh, you definitely do have deadlines and that kind of thing, where a big question mark about research would be a, a tough pill to swallow as far as people trying to schedule things and that kind of thing. So um, can, can you say if, if uh, BioWare generally uses uh, their own engine or if they're using something off the shelf like Unreal or Unity? Um, well, the, let's see. You might have to just look it up and see if it's public knowledge. I, th I think the engine that, the engines that we've used over the years have been public knowledge and stuff, but uh, I know back in the day when it was more common, like Bioware used to make their own engines and then their games, and then they actually released the engines for like people to mod the games and that kind of stuff. And then like uh, now there's, there are very few engines because it's such a giant undertaking with all the next gen consoles. And all, it's very all expensive. The, yeah. It's, it's crazy expensive. So yeah, we're, we're definitely not developing them. Um, but yeah, look it up. I'm, I'm sure it is, the, that knowledge exists somewhere. <laughs> Sounds good. I might just do that. Yeah. So 15 years in, it's a long time. You still love what you do? Yep. Um, it's definitely, I mean, it's a challenge for sure. It's, it's not like that Westwood commercial where you're just holding a controller and like the game falls out, uh, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> Oh yeah, but yeah, it's yeah. Like, there's different challenges wherever you go. Like, for you guys, you know, working on games that aren't hundreds of people, there's definitely di different challenges than than bigger ones. But you you'll definitely run into them no matter where you go, and that's good. Carino has three non full time people working on it right now. Yeah. That's our that's Trello pretty... board goes out to 2026. <laughs> we really just have a single principal developer and an asshole who makes music. <laughs> we also have a guy out of Madrid who we're paying to make graphics for us, who I quite like. He's, he's doing a great job. Well, him and another guy are doing it. Yeah, he's very talented. Yeah. His name is Sandalo. So, so, Doug, all, 15 years in, you haven't wanted to take the plunge into the indie side of things, you know, take that risk, not make any money at all, you know, <laughs> just take on all that crazy risk. That's, yeah. I mean, I always think about it. You do the kind of grass is greener on the other side, side of it, where you just think about all the, the fun side of it, where you're kind of punching the stuff and seeing it in game and being really proud. And then you remember that you have to do things like find people in Madrid to make you graphics yeah. and make do a podcast so that people know about you and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, I don't know how well it's working yet, but anyway. <laughs> so yeah, there's for the most part, no, uh, I've gotten the kind of being part of making a game that you're really proud of from, you know, games that millions of people love like Mass Effect and uh, Anthem and that kind of thing. Um, and then for the other side of it, you know, I've, I've played around with little prototypes on my own, which I, I generally can't, most companies have a, a clause in their contract where you can't just release games and sell them. But that's kind of handy because then I can just kind of play around with them until I get bored and not feel bad that I'm abandoning a project, whereas you guys actually want to release it. So one day. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like you do have like a project in the back of your mind that if the stars aligned, you would love to do. Um a project or projects or that kind of thing. Like I've done uh, game jams and that kind of thing. I've played around with, like I made a little game out of a DDR pad and 
made one that kind of hooks up to my spin bike and that kind of thing. So a bigger project, I don't know if there's the kind of thing that I would think. How many years is Kids with Karen Dow going to take? I don't know. A few more years, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have that kind of stick to itiveness to anything floating around in my head right now. <laughs> well, let, let me ask you a question. There's something that kind of you said there that that, that caught my attention. Um, are you more motivated by a technical challenge when it comes to developing games, or is there something else there? Uh, there's, I've, I've found when I've been working on things on my own, there are two things that I am usually uh, interested by. And one is a um, just like a gameplay concept, like a small little fun thing to do. So and play mechanic. Like, yeah. So yeah, like I've made little racing games where like you're you're trying to pay attention to a top down and a side view at the same time. And um and it's just like to see if it's fun, that kind of thing. And then the other is usually I'll run into a um a technical aspect of it that I find interesting. So I was coming up with a prototype to see if like steering by touch screen and then flicking to uh, drift would be kind of fun and I ended up making a system to kind of stream in and out chunks of the world in a game that probably didn't need it but just while I'm at it why not kind of work on something like that so it's kind of those couple of things and then there's stuff I hate so like level design I've, I found if I'm doing a, a game jam I'll leave that to like the last 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 second <laughs> so yeah I actually quite enjoy level design um, when I sit down and think about things that I want to have happen and actually say, like, oh yeah, I could do this and make this happen. And with Karen, I've been trying for every area to make something different about that area that's new to the player. Sometimes it's small, sometimes it's bigger, just some sort of puzzle or challenge that they need to figure out while they're going through the area or something like that. Because it's not fun if you're always doing the same thing over and over again. Or maybe it is. Depends on, uh, that's just me, I guess. I would actually really like level design if I could either draw or if it was like easy to like actually like make or like produce the level. But uh, yeah, that's just something that I've always kind of sucked at. So yeah, I was trying to hope that I can make something procedurally generated and then I won't have to worry about it. I don't know why that's one of the things, but it is. the buzzword of well, at least a couple of years ago, everything was procedurally generated. And that was what you'd see as the pitch line for every indie game in New York City, I swear to God. It, uh, it's like, no, nope, not procedurally generated. This is static. This is what you see is what you get. <laughs> you know what you're getting. Handmade. Yes. Artis Artis yeah, I like that. I yeah. should, use that in, uh, should use that in Kids of Carindale's marketing. <laughs> handmade? Oh my goodness. Handmade artisanal. I remember handmade. <laughs> Locally crafted was like uh, the big buzzword around here a few years back. Was that for beer? <laughs> Everything. Yes, you're not an indie game developer, you're a craft game developer. Ah, uh, I like that. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah, there we go. There we go. I like that. So, um, for, uh, for, so this is something that I talked about uh, on our last podcast. Um, but w with respect to games, for you, Doug, is this some kind? Do you get a lot of artistic, personal expression from this, or does the AAA space kind of take away from that a bit? Um, I would say you get a little bit more hands-on with the creative side of it uh, in smaller games, whereas AAA games, there's there's enough moving parts that. Um, it's tough to just like get something in and that's you know just somebody's offhand suggestion kind of thing um, just because like you know the things that go into it can be like player research and like market stuff and then how long it'll take whereas you know some of the smaller games like uh, in the prototype days of um, Mighty Battles the basically the one other programmer and I on it changed the genre of the game it was in one day you know so you you definitely have a little bit more to play around with there the challenges in 
AAA tend to be more. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Something like that happened at Diablo as well. That used to be a. It was supposed to be a turn-based battle system, and then they made it real time, like overnight one day. Yeah, I, I think I've heard of a few things like that where it just kind of on a, on a whim people can do that, which is, I mean, definitely fun to see. Uh, but yeah, tr AAA is there's definitely a, a bigger runway of you know. To, to get ideas realized. So the challenges tend to be more um, either technical or even organizational or that kind of thing. And a little less, creative. although there, I shouldn't say like, you know, if I had suggestions, you know, designers aren't just gonna be like, well, you're not in our club, so just go away. But there is a lot uh, of moving parts to making those decisions, so. They can't, they can't just do everything <laughs> on a whim, for sure. Sounds great. Um, I only have one question left, but I'm gonna check with Gary to see if he's got anything. Well, you already asked the question that I usually ask every guest, which is about their dream project. But uh, Doug already answered that one, so I'll have to punch that one right back to you there. Sorry, dude, we, we, we stole your thunder. All right, Doug. So I ask the same question to all of our guests. Um, what kind of advice would you give to someone? Uh, maybe a younger version of yourself, maybe me, maybe Gary, maybe just someone else on the internet uh, about how to get into this. Like uh, if someone wanted to go into AAA game development, what, what would you tell them? So yeah, I was thinking about this. The only advice I'd have for younger me are not philosophical. They're very specific. So it'd be like, don't buy that Chevy, it's a piece of shit. Um, <laughs> and you guys already know what you're making, you know how you're making it, you know your audience, that kind of thing. So uh, well, <laughs> well don't, don't make too many assumptions there, but we're working on it. <laughs> you know better than I would anyway. Um, the, the advice I could think of for somebody who, say, wants to get into game development, I would say uh, just be learning things because you never know what will come in handy. Uh, I thought my in to the game industry would be coming up with a pathfinder that just decimated all existing pathfinders. Turns out it was because I knew my way around the database. That's why I was hired. So you just, you never know, just learn stuff. Can't hurt. Huh. Interesting. Doug, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure having you. It's been so long since I've seen you in person. I'm hoping to remedy that soon. Um, but yeah, thanks for doing this. Uh, and yeah, thanks for coming. And we'll chat with you later. Thanks for having me. Peace, Doug. Thanks for joining us on another episode of the Fat Games Podcast. If you're enjoying our material, please consider liking and subscribing. We also recently released the Kids of Carindow demo for free on Steam. Please consider checking it out. The link is in the description below. Once again, from Burgle's Bounty, we are playing the Candyland music. Enjoy!